Hey guys, welcome to episode number 567. Today is Monday, so it's update Monday. And I wanted to start this video outdoors because we've had some weather. We've had a lot of questions about how the greenhouse is doing, how the fish and the pond are doing outside. So let's take a look. We just got two inches of ice on the ground. It's been really cold. It was like negative 10 degrees out last night. So let's walk around the greenhouse and the pond to see what's up. If you haven't already, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you wanna help support this channel, you can go check out myaquariumbox.com. All right, it's getting pretty cold out. I don't wanna stay outside too long. We got stuff to do inside as well. So come along with me and learn how to be a better aquarist. All right, so we've had a lot of questions about how the greenhouse has been holding up with the weather. And as you can see, uh, it's doing pretty well. Um, we do have a little bit of snow and a little bit of ice that's on the roof, as you can see. But the Gambrel style of greenhouse roof uh, doesn't allow too much to collect on the top because it just starts to fall off when it hits this part of the roof over here. The biggest problem that I've noticed uh, with these sliding doors is that as soon as snow and ice builds up right down here on the track, it becomes pretty much impossible to open uh, these doors. But have no fear, uh, it was negative 10 degrees out last night, but it's gonna be uh, upwards of 50 degrees later this week. So we'll just wait a couple days and that will uh, thaw itself out and we'll be good to go. So, greenhouse is doing fine. Uh, not a lot going on in there. Obviously nothing is growing. I'm not heating it. So everything is drained out. All the water is drained out. None of the pumps are on or anything. The only thing that's on um, inside the greenhouse is an air pump. And as you can see, and you might be able to hear as well, we've got an airline running right here, sort of a larger diameter airline running uh, through the snow, through the ice, into the pond. And we're at the edge of the pond here, but you can see we do have a very small opening now, um, which is still open. Those bubbles and that air movement and water movement is keeping that top exposed just enough to allow our uh, oxygen exchange, air exchange, gas exchange up at the top of this pond. But otherwise, the entire top of this pond is completely frozen over. Now we've got basically two inches of snow and ice covering it as well. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if in total, there, there's probably close to two inches of, of snow and ice, if not more um, on top of that pond. But one of the things that I'm actually excited about is the fact that the ground surrounding the pond is still just as frozen as uh, everything else in the backyard here. Typically, if you've got heat escaping through the sides of a pond like this, um, then the, the patio would be um, less frozen than the surrounding area. But as we can see, I believe that insulation that we put down uh, underneath those patio pavers is doing a really good job keeping all of the heat underground and against the side of that tank. So that's the pond. That's the greenhouse. It is super freaking cold outside. So we're going to head indoors to perform some more projects for the rest of the day. But I'm pretty pleased at the fact that the snow and the ice doesn't accumulate on the roof here. Very pleased that our air is able to keep a hole punched in the top of this thing. So hopefully the fish are doing well down there hibernating. Uh, I guess we won't know until later this week when uh, the weather warms up a little bit. But for now, they look like they're pretty snug. Not very cozy, but uh, <laughs> encased in ice almost. So that little hole in the top is uh, really the, the, the only lifesaver they've got. Um, I don't have a heater to put in a pond like this. I think it would be a giant waste of energy. But if this thing was to freeze completely solid, that's the next step I would probably have to take. But anyways, let's head inside before we freeze to death and we'll continue on with our day. 
All right, we are back inside and it's nice to finally warm up. It is so incredibly cold outside. I thought we would spend the rest of our time today indoors, but I do have a story to tell. So this weekend we traveled to New Hampshire for a quick weekend vacation and we went ice fishing for the very first time I went ice fishing. It's something that I've wanted to do for a very long time, but living in Massachusetts, it hasn't really been cold enough for long enough to form a thick enough layer of ice where I live to really have a good time and experience ice fishing. So we decided to pack everything up, go on a quick trip to New Hampshire. It has been very cold for a very long time in New Hampshire. And in northern New Hampshire, when we got there, there was two feet of ice on the lake that we traveled to, which was awesome. It was so thick that people had their trucks on the ice, people were driving their snowmobiles all over the ice, and people were even plowing roads on the ice. So clearly thick enough for people to walk around and ice fish. So first time ice fishing, all we really had was a few uh, poles, a few tilts, and a hand ice auger. I was actually really impressed at how well the ice auger worked, the handheld ice auger, uh, at drilling holes in the ice, two feet thick. It really only took about 20 or 30 seconds to drill a hole all the way through the ice, which was pretty good. In total, I think we only drilled about five holes. We were probably out there for four or five hours total. We tried both uh, hand jigging with rods and also setting up tilts. And tilts are the things that have the little flag that pops up when you've caught a fish. We also tried the two uh, recommended forms of bait. One which is power bait and the other one is uh, live bait, uh, shiners specifically. So we tried both of those things and we had five holes in the ice. Um, we had two or three rods going. We had two or three tilts going and we were there for four or five hours. It was a beautiful day out. It was sunny. It wasn't too cold. It, there was absolutely no wind whatsoever. So it actually made it pretty manageable. Now, don't get me wrong. It got really cold and all we had were the clothes we were wearing and a piece of cardboard that we put down over the ice to try to help protect us from getting too cold. We also had some hand warmers and some foot warmers. Those helped a little bit. And every once in a while, we had to jump in the car just to warm up. But all in all, we had a really good time. It was a great learning experience. The only thing is we didn't catch a single fish. We saw plenty of other people out around us that had tilts set up and we did see them catch a few fish. I do know that the pond we were on uh, is usually stocked with fish, so there were definitely fish there, but alas, we did not catch one. So it was a great experience. I had a lot of fun. We got really cold in the process, but uh, I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. Hopefully the next time we go, we can catch a fish and I'll do a proper video on that experience. But for now, this is all we captured and we didn't catch anything. All right, so with all of that said, it was a really fun weekend, but it's nice to be home and it is cold out. So let's continue on with some of the other projects we have around the fish room. One thing that I've wanted to do for a very long time is to test, do a little scientific test as best I can perform a test to see what substance produces the most tannins when introduced to an aquarium. Now, you can use a lot of things to create a black water aquarium full of tannins, and some of these tanks are very, very cool to look at. Some people don't like the tint to the color to the water, other people love it, and some fish actually require it for breeding, to simulate or to stimulate breeding. So 
I've used things like driftwood and leaves and there's all kinds of things you can add to a tank. Anything that's woody in nature, anything that was alive and is now dead, chances are it has some amount of tannins in it and there are quite a few ways to introduce those to your aquariums. But specifically what I wanted to test is what has the most tannins? What can release the most tannins and stain your water, the deepest, darkest, black water aquarium, the fastest? So what's the most potent thing you can do to add tannins to your water? So I devised a little test. What I did was I picked five of my favorite tannin producing products. And here are samples of what those are. The first one is called Rooibos Tea. And this is actually something that you can drink. It's basically the ground up leaves and branches of a tree uh, from Africa. And it's actually sold as a tea. You can actually buy it and drink it like you would a green tea or an Earl Grey tea or whatever else. And this is what it looks like in its loose leaf form. It's sort of a red color, woody, stemmy in nature. And uh, it does have quite the smell to it as well. Um, so that was the first one I wanted to test because if we're gonna um, produce tannins, we might as well start with something that is already in tea form. Now, to keep it fair, what I wanted to do is take everything else and try to grind it down to the same size as that tea. So we've got the rooibos tea, that's the first one. The second one is alder cones. Now obviously the surface area on alder cones versus a ground up loose leaf tea is quite different. So what we did was we took a coffee grinder to grind up all of our other ingredients to get them hopefully to the same size and consistency uh, like grain size as that tea. So the second one was alder cones. The third one was casserina cones. And these ones are a little bit stronger, uh, but they're not quite as dense. So I'm thinking it might take a few more of these uh, chopped up to get to that fine tea consistency. But the third one we have is casserina cones. And then we've got, we move on to a couple different leaves. Uh, this is an Indian almond leaf. And these are widely used in the aquarium hobby, both in their, in their natural leaf form and also ground up and made into a tea form. Um, so I'm really interested in seeing how well this performs. And then lastly is something that I have laying all over my yard, which is an oak leaf. And so this is the native leaf that I have to my area. So chopping those up, grinding them up, getting all of them to that same tea-like consistency so that I can take 10 grams of each one of those substances, feel pretty confident that the surface area of each one of those samples is pretty similar, and then steep that over eight fluid ounces of water, hot water, just like you're making tea. Basically boil that water, dump it in at the same exact time on all five of those samples, and then stir it up and let it set until it goes all the way down to room temperature. Then at the end, which one wins? Which one has the darkest colored water? Which one is able to produce the most tannins per gram. That's what we're trying to figure out. It's going to be quasi-science because we're not going to be able to exactly tell, uh, but hopefully by using all five of these different ingredients in their own test glasses, we should be able to get a pretty good gradient and tell which one produces the least and which one produces the most tannins just by looking at the color, the shade of that water. So let's perform the test. 
let's go see which one is going to come out on top and which one is going to be at the bottom. So let's go test that out. All right, guys, and here is the finished product from our little science experiment. Now, these have been ranked from right to left as the least amount of tannins to the most amount of tannins. So let's quickly walk through them so we can see. In fifth place, we have the Casarina cone. Now, these things are a little bit hard to grind up and as you can probably see in the bottom of this glass, there are some chunks of cones, like the middles of those cones that aren't completely blended up. So this may not be a completely accurate representation. If these were chopped a little bit more finely, maybe it would um, come out to a color closer to this one. But regardless, this one is by far the weakest in terms of the color of the tea that it creates at the end. In fourth place, we have the alder cone, as you can see here. These ones actually chopped up quite a bit nicer. I think it's just because they're a little bit of a more fragile uh, cone, so they are a little bit easier to blend up. And the resulting tannin tea is quite dark, but, um, it is still in fourth place out of all of these. Now, one important thing to mention, this test was done as fairly as possible. Um, you know, there's 10 grams of each substance in each one of these glasses, and there's eight ounces of water in every glass. But one thing I'd like to note, as we're still talking about the cones, is because these were sort of chopped up um, from a cone shape to sort of a, a powder shape um, or consistency I should say it is interesting to note that the cones are on the weaker end of all five of these substances so 
I don't know if that's due to more tannins being located in the leaves um, than in cones or if that's just because the, the cones had to be chopped up and uh, the leaves might have more surface area because they are thinner um, and they're easier to, to grind. But take it or leave it, that's just an observation. It's interesting to note that both of the cones are on the weaker end of this scale. Now, in the exact middle, in third place, we have the rooibos tea. This stuff is basically just chopped up leaves and branches of an African uh, plant, I believe. And as you can see, it is a nice dark color. And out of all of these, I believe this one has the, the most red tint to the tannin tea color. And that one sits right in the middle. But by far, the two that have the strongest, deepest, darkest tannin color to the tea would be the leaves that we ground ourselves. And so in second place, we have our uh, oak leaf. And interesting to note that uh, the oak leaf, it, a lot of it is just sort of like in this layer down here. So there is quite a bit of mulm uh, for, from that oak leaf that's down on the bottom and there's not a whole lot of liquid that's left up at the top. So one could say that um, potentially because this takes up so much space and there's less water sort of in this space that maybe this shows as darker than it actually is. But regardless, it's still the same amount um, in each glass. So this one is certainly in second place and then the all-star of course in first place is the Indian almond leaf I kind of had a feeling going in that it was either going to be the rooibos tea or the Indian almond leaf leaf that was going to take first place but as we can see this one is by far the deepest darkest richest color and again we do have that sediment layer on the bottom from the fine particulate uh, from those leaves that was chopped up, but then we've got a lot more water, uh, clear water um, on the top of this glass than we do in um, the oak leaf glass. But that is a quick look at all five of these after the experiment has been run. This water went from uh, steaming hot uh, boiling water that you would use to make tea all the way down to room temperature. Each glass was stirred a total of three times while it was cooling down and what you see here is the result of that action. Again, we've got 10 grams of each type of leaf or tea substance and then we have uh, eight fluid ounces of water in each of the glasses. And this is the end result after everything has come down to room temperature. So if you're looking to add the most tannins to your water, if you're looking for the most potent thing to add tannins, add black water, add that tea stained color to your aquarium, I think your best bet is most likely the Indian almond leaf. And there's two ways to go about this. You can either put the leaves in whole and they will release those tannins slowly over time because it's uh, a much smaller surface area or you can grind them up and steep them in a tea like we just did to get that result very, very quickly. And I think what you would see if you added this, any one of these to a 10 gallon tank, you would instantly get um, a good tea stand color to that tank. In fact, if you want to learn more about rooibos tea and how to brew that and how to add that to your aquarium, I would highly suggest checking out Rachel O'Leary's video on the subject. You can find it on YouTube. And if you do have things like cones, it's not a bad thing to use those to add tannins to the water. Um, what I would recommend though is that you probably don't waste your time chopping them up into smaller pieces. Um, it's probably just easier to add them whole and they will last 
a lot longer because they are, you know, a stronger, thicker, woodier substance. They last a lot longer in the tank than a leaf will. So the leaves might be giving off more tannins because they've certainly won this battle, but that doesn't mean that these guys won't stick around for a longer period of time in your tank. Anyways, guys, I hope this was helpful. I tried to follow a scientific process. I tried to keep it as strict as possible so that I could get the best results possible. And what you're looking at is, I think, a pretty accurate representation of how many tannins and to what degree 10 grams of each one of these substances is able to stain eight fluid ounces of water. That being said, of course, I cannot account for the exact surface area of that 10 grams. So something that is in a looser, finer powder like a tea is probably going to have a better shot than something like a cone. But these are my results. I encourage you to go do your own tests. And if you're interested in setting up a black water aquarium, if you want the most tannins possible, go with a leaf. And if you want something that's going to last longer, but give off less tannins over time, you probably want to go with a cone. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. And this was a pretty fun experiment. All right, guys, and that's going to do it for this week's video. We had a lot of fun. We had a very long weekend, a very cold weekend. We got to see the status of the outdoor greenhouse of the pond in negative 10 degree temperatures it was so cold out there and it's really interesting to see how well that system is holding up through the winter it's basically on life support all that we've got running is one air pump but as long as that hole stays punched through that ice those goldfish should be just fine we also got to see some clips of my adventure this weekend with ice fishing I hope to be able to go back at some point and actually catch a fish, but regardless, I had a lot of fun out there on the ice, drilling holes, setting up tilts, and basically just having a blast, being outside, enjoying nature. I think catching fish would be a lot more fun, so hopefully we get to do that next time, but regardless, it was great. And then, of course, the big tannin experiment. It's always nice to perform a experiment. It's always nice to share those results with people. It's nice to be curious. And I think in this case, we found that Indian almond leaves are by far the best at producing tannins when it's gram for gram, fluid ounce for fluid ounce of water being steeped. So if you're in the market for a blackwater aquarium, if you're trying to breed fish that require tannins in the water to be comfortable and happy and healthy and exhibit those breeding behaviors, I would definitely recommend starting with the Indian almond leaves, either whole or like we saw steeped in a tea form. Doesn't mean the other four that we tested out are no good. As you saw, they all produced a lot of tannins and it really just comes down to which one is going to work best for you. If you're looking for something that's quick and easy, rooibos tea is already in that tea form. You don't have to cut it, you don't have to grind it, it's ready to go. All you need to do is heat up your water. And of course, if you're looking for something that will last more long-term, those cones are just plop them in the tank and they'll start producing tannins all on their own. But hopefully you enjoyed the experiment and hopefully you can take those results and apply them to what you're doing in your own aquariums and your own fish breeding. Anyways guys, that's gonna do it for this week's video. We've got a lot more to accomplish down in the fish room. I have a feeling it's gonna be cold here for a few more months and we've got a lot to do down here. So hopefully you will return next Monday and watch what I've got going on down here in the fish room. As always, if you want to and you like this video, please hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. And if you wanna help support this channel, you can always go check out myaquariumbox.com. Hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you guys later.